government operations will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess um, at any time. Good morning, y'all. Um, the IT and government operations subcommittees have constantly highlighted the need for IT reform at large and the waste, fraud, and abuse that comes along with it. Uh, for real reform to happen, the federal government needs talented, experienced people to work on IT projects that are bigger than themselves. There's no question that there's a need to reform outdated laws. Um, the current procurement structure prevents the proverbial two guys or two gals in a garage from selling technology to the federal government, when often their product may be cheaper and more innovative than another solution. It should be much easier for startups and small companies to sell to and work with the federal government. We need fresh ideas and an outside-the-box thinking to permeate all levels of government. 18F was launched just over two years ago with 15 staff members. Today, 18F has 185 staff members and growing and has transformed into an entirely new division within the GSA, complete with its own commissioner and budget. How did that happen? What was its original mission? What is its current mission? Is it achieving its stated purpose to make the government's digital services simple, effective, and easier for the American people? If not, what can we change to ensure it does? Because that is the goal I think all of us are here today to support. Additionally, I have concerns about the funding mechanism with which 18F is supported. As the GAO notes, 18F is to recover costs to the Acquisition Services Fund and is required to have a plan to achieve full cost recovery. Um, recent reports suggest that it may be doing just the opposite. Today, I hope that we can gain a more transparent view of 18F's mission and the full scope of their activities. The United States Digital Service was formed in the wake of the failure of the launch of healthcare.gov to procure the outside talent, uh, tech talent that was needed to make the website operational. Its stated mission is to improve and simplify the digital experience that people and businesses have with their government. I'm concerned with potential duplication and overlap. This committee is well aware of the costs associated with the duplicative and overlapping programs, and let me assure you we don't need two more. This committee has held numerous hearings this, con this, this Congress with agency CIOs as witnesses, primarily focused on the state of IT and cybersecurity at agencies and the implementation of FATARA, and we will continue to do so and hold agency CIOs accountable. A FATARA is important because it will give CIOs greater budget authority and empower them to make bold decisions. But with the power also comes accountability. We will hold CIOs accountable for their decisions. Under FATARA, nothing of any significance related to IT should be happening at agencies without the involvement and sign-off of agency CIOs, period. I'm concerned by reports that USDS teams may parachute into an agency, fix whatever they perceive was the problem, and then leave without the full buy-in and involvement of the agency CIO. That should never happen. It is contrary to the entire purpose of FATARA. I hope to hear today concrete steps USDS has taken to ensure they involve agency CIOs from the beginning when working on a project at an agency. As usual, Mr. Pounder and GAO have done great work in this area, and I would highly advise both 18F and USDS to implement GAO's recommendations. As I've said before, taxpayers deserve a government that leverages technology to serve them rather than one that deploys unsecure, decades-old technology that places their sensitive and personal information at risk. They also deserve a federal government that is transparent. We can harness the power of the cloud. We can upgrade our legacy systems. We can get smart people to come work for the federal government. We can do all this because despite our problems, America is still a country of innovators. If 18F and USDS can help us achieve an efficient and transparent government worthy of its people and do so in a way that is clear, cost-effective, measurable, and appropriate for government role, then I'm very open to supporting them. However, these conversations will help give us a clearer view and inform us on whether they need to be restructured, reformed, or restricted. And I thank the witnesses for being here today and look forward to their testimonies and hearing from specific ways we can bring cutting edge technology and technology talent um, into the federal government. I'd now like to recognize uh, my friend, the gentlewoman from the great state of Illinois and ranking member of the Subcommittee on Information Technology for her open Kelly. Ms. Kelly, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hurd, for holding this important hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for taking the time to be here this morning. As we all know, the federal government relies on information technology in countless ways. 
Most importantly, Americans rely on IT to ex access services and connect with the government, from signing up for health care to applying for student loans to securing veterans' benefits. And when the government's IT services aren't working, the government isn't working. We've learned this from our experience with healthcare.gov and other recent IT challenges. Although the Affordable Care Act is much more than a website, we saw what happens when we try to implement good policy without the underlying IT infrastructure to support it. That's why the administration created the U.S. Digital Service and 18F. The stated goals of USDS and 18F are to improve and modernize government IT operations and help the government become better at procuring, developing, and sharing IT going forward. These are worthy goals. And the USDS and 18F have made great strides toward reaching them. For example, USDS has helped the Department of Homeland Security launch an online immigration review process. This is a project that DHS has been working on for nearly a decade at a cost of $1 billion. 18F is in the process of developing a new IT acquisition process that will make it easier for federal agencies to contract with vendors that provide agile software development services. I look forward to hearing more about these and other success stories today. One of the greatest achievements of the digital service and 18F have been the ability to attract and recruit incredible talent from the tech industry into the federal government. At almost every hearing we, we hold, I ask agency heads to list some of their greatest challenges, and without fail, we hear about the challenges of recruiting and retaining a talented IT workforce. I've been impressed by 18F and USDS's ability to open the door to public service in one of our fastest growing industries. These employees are using the knowledge, skills, and experience they've gained in the private sector to help improve federal IT. In addition to recruiting the best and the brightest in tech talent, we need to continue leveraging the resources and expertise that of our partners in the private sector. They are eager to help bring federal IT into the 21st century. I look forward to hearing from, these, from the witnesses and how the mission of these offices differs from what the private sector offers through government contracts. What value added do these programs bring? How are your roles changing and what limitations do you face? But in order for the digital service and 18F to fully realize their potential, they need to be transparent about the good work they are doing. They should also continue to engage stakeholders and Congress so we can all understand the important role they play in modernizing federal IT and help shape the role going forward. Thank you again to our witnesses for being here and to my colleagues for holding this important hearing. I yield back. Thank you, and I will hold the record open for five legislative days for any members who would like to submit a written statement. I will now recognize our panel of witnesses. I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Mikey Dickerson, Administrator of the U.S. Digital Service. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, Ms. Phaedra Crusos, a Commissioner of the Technology Transformation Service at the Government Services Administration. Thanks for being here, and thank you for the information you and your staff um, have provided us in advance of this hearing. Very um, important to understand what y'all are doing and, and help us with our oversight role and make sure we can support y'all um, on, on the activity. So that kind of uh, back and forth is, is really important. Um, Mr. A.R. Trey Hodgkins, Senior Vice President, Public Sector at the Information Technology Alliance for Public Sector. Thank you for being here. And Mr. David LaDuke, uh, Senior Director of Policy, Public Policy at the Software and Information Industry Association. Appreciate you being here. And last but not least, and number one in our hearts, uh, Mr. David Pounder, Director of IT Management Issues at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Always a pleasure to have you here today, sir. Welcome to you all. And pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. So please rise and, and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record reflect the witnesses answered in the affirmative. In order to allow time for discussion, um, we would appreciate it if you all would limit your testimony to five minutes. Um, your entire written statement will be made part of the record. Um, now, I'd like to recognize Mr. Dickerson for your opening um, statement. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Hurd, Ranking Member Kelly, Chairman Meadows, Ranking Member Connolly, and all members of the subcommittees, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. 
Millions of people interact with the United States government every day, relying on digital products such as websites, online forms, and mobile apps to access and understand government services. Americans are accustomed to the high standards of service set by the private sector, but outdated technology and complicated user interfaces can sometimes make interactions with the government frustrating and inefficient. Americans deserve simple, effective digital services. We are in a new era of technology and innovation in the U.S. government, and we are using the latest technology to deliver better services, engage Americans, and tackle tough challenges. President Obama launched the United States Digital Service less than two years ago as a means to improve our nation's most important public-facing digital services. The U.S. Digital Service, or USDS, is a collaboration between our country's top te technical talent in product design and software engineering and the government's brightest leaders and civil servants who work in partnership to apply private sector best practices to our digital services. In 2014, the small team of technologists initially planned to focus on three projects, but with additional funding and the support of Congress starting in fiscal year 2015, the size and scope of the USDS has increased. Today, the USDS has small teams working on high-priority projects with a number of agencies across the government. The work of USDS is centered on four main goals. First and foremost is to transform critical services. The USDS is focused on improving our nation's most important public-facing services. The team helps to manage technology projects working alongside civil servants and IT contractors. The second goal is to rethink how we build and buy digital services. The USDS is working to modernize procurement processes and practices for the digital era by developing training programs and tools that enable federal contracting officers to apply industry best practices to digital procurements. By increasing the technical knowledge and expertise of contracting officers, the federal government can partner more effectively with the IT private sector, who will continue to deliver the majority of the government's digital services just as they do today. Our third goal is to initiate the development of common platforms and standards. The USDS is working to identify pilot opportunities for common platforms that can improve services needed by multiple agencies. And our fourth goal is in support of the others is to bring top technical talent into public service. In support of these goals, the USDS plans to bring 200 digital service experts into the federal government by the end of 2017. The long-term goal is to build and sustain institutional capacity within agencies while simultaneously encouraging a tradition of public service in the tech professions. In the short amount of time that the USDS has been operating, we have seen success in many projects, especially under the following circumstances. When the USDS team is small and focused on a high-priority project. When agency leadership is engaged and supportive when the USDS team is tightly integrated with existing contractors and career staff, when the project has a hard deadline, and when the project has cross-agency dependencies or many stakeholders across the government. While the USDS is still a very new program, we've already seen early results in improving services for the public. For example, Vets.gov is a single unified digital experience to provide veterans access to the information they need about the VA's benefits, such as educational assistance, health care, and economic opportunities. We're also pleased with the College Scorecard, a tool to help students and their families make better decisions about where to go to college by publishing comprehensive, reliable data on students' employment outcomes and success in repaying their student loans. By applying the best practices in technology and design to the federal government, the USDS helps enable the delivery of more reliable and effective digital services to the American public. Through the recruitment of top technology talent from one of the most competitive industries in the world, the USDS is inspiring a tradition of public service in the tech professions which will help the federal government continue to deliver crucial services. I thank the committee for holding this hearing and for your commitment to providing top-notch digital services to the American people. I am pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Now, Ms. Phaedra Crusos, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. 
Good morning, Chairman Hurd and Meadows, Ranking Members Kelly and Conley, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I left the private sector two years ago to join the federal government's efforts to improve the public's experience with the government. Having founded and successfully led two internet companies prior to joining public service, I'm particularly excited to speak with you about 18F, an organization that is helping bring government closer to the technology practices and methodologies of the private sector. As you know, GSA's mission includes providing the best value and technology to the federal government and the American people. The work of 18F is a vital part of that mission. In March 2014, recognizing that too many of our government's digital services are not designed to meet the needs of the people who use them, are not delivered on time, and are often over budget, GSA launched 18F, a 15-person startup within its agency. In the last two years, 18F has grown to 185 people, attracting cutting-edge technologists from both the industry and the public sector, and has worked on more than 150 projects with 63 federal entities. The organization has also evolved its service offerings to respond to the technology needs of its agency customers. This two-year-old startup is making progress towards its mission of making the government's digital services simple, effective, and easier to use for the American people. I'd like to highlight just one example of 18F's work. In June of 2014, 18F signed its very first interagency agreement with the Federal Election Commission that asked for help in making the 90 million records they house more readily accessible to the public. It was the first time FEC had worked with an agile, user-centered team like 18F, and our work has transformed the way they approach technology today. In the words of our partners at FEC, we got so much more than a website, we had a complete culture change about how to do user-centered design and agile. This project embodies the way 18F works, a focus on data, a close partnership with stakeholders and users, building in the open, and the opportunity for the transformation of practices and processes within our customer agencies. Early on, during engagements such as this one with the FEC, HNF recognized that a team of in-house technologists in government simply cannot, on its own, rebuild the federal government's vast information technology systems. We also needed to partner with the private sector. One of HNF's first joint efforts with GSA's Federal Acquisition Service was the creation of the Agile Blanket Purchase Agreement, a new contract vehicle designed to provide 18F and their agency customers access to the innovative technical talent that exists in the private sector today. 18F's partnership with the private sector is integral to the success of its efforts and is crucial for scaling this organization's impact across the federal government. The promise of 18F's work aside, I recognize that this young organization has room to improve its operations significantly. HNF was launched as a startup in government two years ago, and the organization is learning while it scales and matures. The insightful analysis and recommendations put forward by the Government Accountability Office will contribute to our learning and help 18F become a stronger organization. We value transparency and welcome continued oversight of all of our efforts from GAO, the GSA, GSA Inspector General, and this committee. I'd like to close by emphasizing that the scale and scope of the technology challenges facing federal agencies is larger than 18F could ever address on its own. As the committee noted in a recent hearing, the need for the federal government to improve its technology is imperative to creating a government that's transparent, effective, responsive, and secure. Addressing the challenges we face in this area demands continued leadership and close partnership with the Office of Management and Budget, federal agencies, and the private sector, which will continue to play a critical role in delivering technology solutions that agencies need. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Pounder. We recognize now for five minutes for your opening remarks. Chairman Hurd, Ranking Member Kelly, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for having us testify on our ongoing work looking at GSA's 18F and OMB's U.S. Digital Services. For each of these organizations, I will provide a brief overview, positive developments, and areas that we believe need improvements. Starting with 18F, it was established in March 2014. Its mission is to transform the way the federal government builds and buys digital services. Agencies come to 18F for their services and pay for these services since 18F is funded out of a revolving fund within GSA. Therefore, it operates on revenue generated from its business instead of an appropriation. Their plan is to start having full cost recovery in 2019. 18F has over 170 staff and has worked with approximately 20 agencies on more than 30 projects. These projects include building secure websites, mm -hmm. obtaining cloud services, and providing consulting and training on agile practices. 18F has worked on some major IT projects like the U.S. Immigration Transformation and the VA Benefits Delivery System. They also have two initiatives where agencies will be able to quickly access agile and cloud services. 
Our customer satisfaction survey showed that most customers were pleased with their services. We think they could do a better job on defining outcome-oriented goals and performance measures. During the course of our review, they developed these goals and measures. Some of these are good, like saving $250 million and having a 90 percent customer satisfaction score, but others, like growing their staff to over 200, are not outcome-oriented. We also think there should be measures and targets for full cost recovery. 18F acknowledges that these goals and metrics need further development. Now turning to USDS, it was established in August 2014. Its mission is to transform the most important digital services for citizens. USDS typically goes to agencies in that they do not charge agencies for their services because they have an appropriation. For fiscal year 16, they plan to spend about $14 million. USDS has about 100 staff within OMB. It has worked with approximately 11 agencies on about 15 projects. These projects include information security assessments, system stabilization, and software engineering. USDS has worked on seven major IT projects, including U.S. Immigration Transformation and SSA's Disability Case Processing. A much higher percentage of their work is associated with large IT acquisitions when compared to 18F. Our customer satisfaction survey showed that all customers that responded were satisfied with their services. Similar to 18F, USDS could do a better job defining outcome-oriented goals and performance measures. During the course of our review, these goals and measures were developed. Some are good, like measurably improving five to eight of the government's most important citizen-facing services, but others, like increasing the quality and quantity of technical vendors, are not outcome-oriented. We also think USDS has continued focused on the highest priority federal IT projects that are to be that are to be identified quarterly to the appropriation committees is important. Finally, as USDS establishes agency digital service teams, it is critical that these relationships with C is consistent with CIOs and what is currently in FATARA and all the oversight that your subcommittees have performed to strengthen CIO authorities. We have concerns about some of these agency teams doing an end around the CIO organizations. In conclusion, it is important that these two organizations clearly demonstrate their value by improving performance measures. 18F needs to continue to work towards full cost recovery, while USDS needs to ensure that agency digital service teams do not undermine the CIO authorities that are being bolstered with FATARA. This concludes my statement. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Pounder. Mr. Hodgkins, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Chairman Hurd and Meadows, Ranking Members Kelly and Connolly, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to share our perspectives regarding the U.S. Digital Service and the General Services Administration's 18F and their efforts to improve a government's approach to information technology. My name is Trey Hodgkins, and I am the Senior Vice President for the Public Sector at the Information Technology Industry Council, where I manage our public sector-facing practice called the IT Alliance for Public Sector, known as ITAPS. <clears throat> The tech sector has for some time been leading the focus on evolving the way the government acquires and manages information technologies, moving them from practices, processes, and protocols too often rooted in an era that predates the Internet to the 21st century. Our members believe such a transformation is necessary to fully apply today's technologies to government missions. Early in the current administration, industry helped develop goals to kickstart such an evolution. USDS and 18F embody some of those pursuits, including bringing about cultural and process change. These include using agile instead of waterfall development methodologies, designing systems based on end-user needs in the context of the agency mission, and leveraging a multi-generational workforce. In many ways, 18F and USDS are positioned to be key enablers in the efforts to achieve a digital government. ITAPS regularly advocates for institutional disruption in the way the government buys and manages IT, and we embrace 18F and USDS as disruptors in the federal space. They also manifest what the tech sector has been saying for some time. Breaking out of the old processes allows innovation to flourish. Contractors do not have that same flexibility in today's market with strict contract requirements, static funding cycles, and a rigid compliance structure. If contractors were suge to suggest innovative and perhaps time and money saving solutions, their bids would be deemed non-responsive because they did not follow the requirements and essentially be disqualified. 
Both of these programs have demonstrated how innovation can be injected into government if you peel away the layer, layers upon layers of rigid process now in place. Imagine what could be accomplished if we were to permit companies to think outside the box in the same fashion. We believe that these initiatives, like any new startup, faces pitfalls and obstacles, and the remainder of my comments offer recommendations on areas to focus, practices to adjust, and outcomes to illuminate in order to sustain them into the next administration. People do not always embrace change, and disruption can also expose programs to risk. We believe the risks facing these programs can be grouped into three categories, which are people, management, and technology, and I provide greater detail on these in my written testimony. These programs should address these risks and mitigate for them. Based on our discussions with vendors and government personnel, there is a general lack of clarity and understanding about these programs. What are they doing? What are they not? And how can they be expected to operate? This opaqueness has created a degree of uncertainty, concern, and suspicion. To address and counter these perceptions, and to ensure that these programs can be sustained into the future, attention should immediately be paid to creating a very transparent and open operating environment. Furthermore, applying comprehensive metrics will provide oversight to ensure the interests of the taxpayers and to demonstrate that these programs are not wasteful of time and resources. The committee also included the formation of the Technology Transformation Service, TTS, in today's discussion. As the operational arm of a list of OMB initiatives and, and policies, GSA needs to clearly explain how these new roles and responsibilities relate to their mission and to the broader industrial base, and how and with whom they will engage. GSA should also clearly explain how the entity is to be funded, where their authorities and personnel come from, and whether these activities must be authorized by statute. Leaving these and other questions unaddressed will expose ATF and GSA itself to challenges from uninformed stakeholder communities. ITAPS believes that a number of adjustments should be made to the programs to best position them for a clear trajectory into the next administration. Each program should clarify their mission. 18F in particular has expanded the reach and scope of their activities and created a condition where 18F acts as both the buyer and the seller. This is a conflict of interest, and such authorities should not be added to their portfolio at this time. Both 18F and USDS should remain focused on the original delivery models. Both programs and the TTS should immediately embark on an effort to become transparent in their operations and to ensure that stakeholders have clarity of purpose for the programs and understand how they can engage. Further, we believe that until the recommended transparency can take hold and effective assessment and analysis can occur, GSA should postpone formalizing TTS. Finally, both programs must find ways to effectively and robustly partner and not compete with new and existing government vendors to deliver better solutions. The technology industry wants to incubate a transformation in the federal IT market that brings about new ways to fund, develop, procure, deliver, manage, and sustain innovative technology solutions. We support 18F and USDS and believe that they can enable elements of such a transformation. We also want this transformation to improve the technological experience for everyone, constituents and citizens, taxpayers, government employees, and vendors. ITAPS remains committed to working with our government partners to achieve such success. With that, I conclude my remarks, and I'm happy to address your questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. LeDuc, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, Chairman Hurd. Um, Chairman Meadows and Ranking Member Kelly. Um, on behalf of the Software and Information Industry Association, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on oversight of the U.S. Digital Service and 18F. SIA is the principal trade association for the software and digital content industries. SIA commends the Obama administration for its work to update and enhance the federal government IT framework, which has strived to evolve federal IT to become more modular, agile, and cloud-focused. And we support much of the core missions of both the USDF, USDS, and 18F to help agencies buy and share efficient and easy to use digital services. But we have reservations with respect to several, <coughs> several aspects of the 18F program. First, 18F's focus on build custom departs from the longstanding reliance on a buy not build IT procurement policy. The buy not build or commercial off the shelf COTS first approach is a long-standing critical component of federal IT policy. This approach is underscored in the revised Circular A130 and shared services policies put forward by this administration. 
Choosing vendor-supported solutions recognizes that agencies often lack and are challenged to maintain consistent and necessary IT management staff. They also benefit from economies of scale, among other advantages. When choosing vendor-supported commercial off-the-shelf solutions, vendors are in the best position working with their agency customers to provide relevant updates, assurances of security and performance. However, 18F is focusing on a build custom approach to develop new solutions that are likely to require sustained, meaningful, and experienced support plans, which are not necessarily available as part of solutions provided by 18F. The importance of ongoing support for agency solutions cannot be overstated, and agencies cannot afford for this to be overlooked. Competition from an 18, 18F can only be expected to grow stronger over time for private sector IT vendors, uh, particularly affecting small businesses. Second, 18F has the ability to operate outside of the traditional procurement process with a dual role of design agency procurements and to compete for the opportunity to provide these solutions without sufficient transparency and oversight. 18F combines policymaking functions, operations, and promotion of their own products and services sales. This is an area where there are many questions about the operation of 18F uh, and not many answers. It appears that 18F could be deployed to design acquisition plans and RFPs and then have an opportunity to respond to that RFP essentially as a sole source consultancy. This end result is not likely to achieve the best value for agencies and it can ignore innovative ideas from the government, outside the government. Private sector IT solutions providers doing business with federal agencies must demonstrate their compliance with critical security requirements, such as FISMA security certifications or the often onerous FedRAMP approval process. 18F should face no less rigorous standards and scrutiny and not be prioritized over offerings because of its address at 18th and F Street. Additionally, of particular concern, concern to this committee, uh, mentioned by Mr. Pounder earlier, um, the risk is that 18F could negate the steps taken to establish appropriate agency CIO oversight established in FATARA. Third, 18F must be required to cover its costs in offering agencies IT services, but transparency is currently lacking in this area as well. 18F should be required to provide a detailed assessment of services provided as well as revenues and expenses to demonstrate whether they are covering costs. And if they are not, they should be required to provide a plan for cost recovery in the near future. Without a sufficient transparency mechanism in this area, it is difficult to make an apples to apples comparison between 18F services and the private sector services. Fourth, the unanswered questions and lack of transparency are particularly concerning given the expansion and recent GSA reorganization of 18F. 18F launched in March 2014, as we know, as a 15-person team of innovators and has grown today to a total of 183 personnel across four nationwide offices. We are concerned the administration is moving very quickly to embed and make permanent the 18F program without seeking input from Congress or working with other agencies and without addressing the issues we have identified. As an internal government IT consulting service, 18F should undergo the traditional oversight and scrutiny by both Congress and the administration to ensure that it will stay within a well-defined designated lane. In closing, following our three recommendations we offer to help guide 18F towards the well-intended goals of the organization. First, greater transparency on cost and process. Second, adherence to the current buy-first approach of commercial off-the-shelf products consistent with federal government IT policy. And third, a requirement to function by the same rules as other IT vendors needing to provide for the same level of scrutiny and comparison on costs. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. LaDuc. I'd like to now recognize uh, Mr. Conley um, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry I'm late. Mr. Meadows and I were in a a postal reform working group meeting for the committee. Um, this hearing is exactly the type of oversight it seems to me that we can agree on on a bipartisan basis. Today's hearing gives us the opportunity to hear from the administration about two programs that are playing uh, an important role in the administration's efforts to modernize and improve IT, federal IT. The federal government spent, of course, $80 billion in IT in 2015. Mr. Pounder, you testified before the full committee just two weeks ago that agencies are spending up to 70, 75 percent of that money on legacy IT systems. GAO's high-risk list includes management of IT acquisitions and operations. Agencies need to modernize their systems 
and their way of thinking about IT investments. The creation of the U.S. Digital Service in 18F in 2014 brought some critical focus to those issues. In 2014, Congress passed, of course, the FITARA legislation, um, the Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act, better known as ISA Connolly. Um, one of the most important changes of that bill was to provide agency CIOs with the authority to make spending decisions related to IT in a more streamlined and efficient manner. The law also requires CIOs to certify progress on ongoing IT investments. Congress gave CIOs that authority and responsibility for a reason. It is imperative that 18F and digital services coordinate with CIOs to ensure that the agencies have a sense of accountability for their investment decisions and also ensure agencies adopt and institutionalize best practices and share them. There are many success stories over the last two years uh, that we look forward to, uh, Ms. Ms. Cherusis and Mr. Dickinson highlighting in their testimony. It was refreshing to see that the GAO found positive customer satisfaction with both 18F and digital service. Um, I'm, I'm proud to co-sponsor the Information Technology Modernization Act, which would create a revolving fund for updating outdated IT systems. Under the bill, 18F would use its expertise to ensure that agencies are have used best practices such as agile development. As Mr. Pano testifies today, there are some areas where both 18F and the U.S. Digital Service can improve and should improve their communications, transparency, coordination, and outreach. I know those are concerns in the private sector, uh, which looks at 18F maybe with a, a mixed and jaundiced eye. GAO found in its review uh, of these programs that the U.S. Digital Service and agencies could do a better job of incorporating the agency CIO into the work of digital service terms. We are interested in hearing from the witnesses today how 18F and the digital service can improve communication with stakeholders and work with the private sector to ensure that the work of those programs is transparent and that the Federal IT portfolio is as effective and as efficient as possible. I appreciate the commitment of the employees of 18F and digital service have made to this government. They are bringing the lessons they have learned from the companies and organizations they come from to improve Federal IT management and procurement. Just as technology has led to private sector job growth, it can also inspire Federal government recruitment of the best and the brightest. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing. I would like to now um, start our questioning portion of this event, and we are going to start with the gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. Farenthold, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hurd. As a uh, former computer consultant and web designer, I guess on a very small scale, I did some of what 18F and USDS uh, did. So it's an issue uh, that I'm passionate about. I do want to start off with the uh, buy not build. Again, even from you know my days in the 90s, it was always cheaper to buy not build. Mr. Ledeck uh, criticized 18F for a not for building, not buying. And I wanted to give uh, uh, Mrs. Crusoe uh, 30 seconds if she wanted to respond to that. Thank you for the opportunity, opportunity to respond to that. Um, one thing that was clearly highlighted in the testimony of my fellow witnesses is that we haven't done a very good job of communicating what 18F does. Over the last two years, we've been very responsive to our customer agencies, and we absolutely take a uh, buy first approach. Uh, we have one service line that builds out prototypes and light web services, but that's done not in competition with the private sector, but in a, as a way to showcase modern methodologies and practices to agencies. All right, now, you indicated you came out of the private sector and into government. I, I want to ask another broad, general question here. There is a very different mindset, especially in the startup world in California, or, or even working in a big company like Google, you know, where you have these big campuses with bicycles everywhere and free meals. How does the government compete for IT talent against that? Um, in one word, it's patriotism. So all of the people that come and join us are very mission-oriented, and they're leaving behind cushier uh, environments, let's say, to come and work on projects that impact the American people. And you look at the technology and startup world, and there is a uh, mentality of uh, 
of, of risk taking and there's a huge push, the, the buzzword is disruption. Mm -hmm. You change fundamentally the way things are, are done. Now obviously the government is not in a position to take risks and I think you can do technology without risks. Banks have indicated that we get much, I, I can do my banking on my phone now and feel relatively uh, safe about it. Uh, but how do you bring into the government a culture of disruption as that's how we really are going to fundamentally transform how things uh, are done. And I'll let, uh, I'll let you answer that, uh, Mrs. Crusos, and then uh, I'd also like to hear from uh, Mr. Leduc on that. Thank you. Um, I think that's the delicate balance that we're always trying to balance. Um, how do you bring innovation but still make sure that it complies with all of the government policies is something that, we, that I personally think about every day as the Commissioner of the Technology Service and as I try and mature my organization. Um, I think h &F faces this, the digital service teams and agencies face this, the innovation labs and agencies right. face this. And think so you think that's the reason that it, it takes so long to get something done in government and IT? Is, is that the primary reason? The, the balance? Uh, of try, yeah, of trying to, uh, yeah, basically that. Yeah. I believe it's a delicate balance. Even the private sector, large companies in the private sector haven't figured that out either. Okay. Um, Mr. Leduc, did you want to, I'm sorry to rush you, I just nope. only have five minutes. No, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we're supportive of, of, the, of the goals of 18F and, and you know, the, their approach to, as they say, hack the, hack the bureaucracy. Um, you know, that's necessary in many areas and, and we, we want to see more innovation. We want to see more, more small startups brought in. So. Okay, great. And then, so Mr. Dickerson, Mrs. Uh, Crusos, can you each tell me what you consider to be your group's biggest success story? Just, you know, 10, 15 seconds here. Sure, it's very, it's very difficult to pick just one, but uh, one success story that we're proud of is uh, vets.gov, which is a uh, unified experience where veterans can get access to services that they need. Okay, and what about uh, 18F? What, what do you all consider your biggest success? For? Our biggest success is the Agile Blanket Purchase Agreement, which is bringing in Agile talent from the private sector into government. All right, so Mr. Dickerson, let's talk, you talked about vets.gov. Uh, your top 10 priorities include uh, electronic health records for uh, veterans' health information systems and technology and architecture. That's uh, Visit A, a medical appointment scheduling system and veterans' benefit management system. I have had countless hearings and my number one source of complaints from my constituents is poor service from the VA, many of which are IT related, even, you know, even to the point of suicide calls going to voicemail. Where are we going on that? Why can't we get that done faster and what are you all doing to fix it? Uh, thank you. We're, uh, we're uh, completely sympathetic and also feel just as acutely as you do uh, the opportunities for improvement in all those services at the VA. Um, I have a small focus team at the VA uh, as we speak uh, today working on a few uh, targeted um, opportunities in that service space. Okay, that doesn't sound like it's big and bold enough to solve the problem. Uh, so I would urge you to do that. Is, is uh, 18F doing anything with the VA at this point? We had, we had worked in partnership with the VA digital service team about a year ago, and we worked on a small uh, component of their bigger picture. All right, well, I, I think we need to sit down with the VA and you guys to see if we can get you all working together because, uh, again, I think the, the poor performance of the VA is a national disgrace that needs to be uh, addressed. I have a lot more I could do, but there are a lot of people here and I'm out of time, so I'll yield back. I'd like to recognize the ranking member, Ms. Kelly, um, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Two weeks ago, the full committee held a hearing on the federal government's use of outdated legacy IT systems. We learned that the federal government spent about $80 million on IT last year, most of, most of which was spent on these old systems. Clearly, we need to find a better path forward, and that's where the digital service and 18F come in. Mr. LeDuc, in your written statement, you said, and I quote, we support much of the core mission of both the USDS and 18F. What role do you think the digital service and 18F can play in the Obama administration's efforts to modernize federal IT? Thank you for that question. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we're very supportive of, uh, of the different thought process that 18F brings um, and, and their goal bringing in 
innovative IT companies, small IT businesses, um, and integrating that into agency solutions, working alongside of agencies to help them um, in designing their procurements and deciding what types of technology they need. We think 18F can be particularly helpful in that role, consulting to agencies to help them uh, obtain the right technology. Does SIA believe that the digital service and ATNF are having an overall positive impact on modernizing the IT acquisition process? Yes, I think we could say you know overall positive. But as I mentioned in my testimony, we just um, want to make sure that it, it you know it, it stays within a you know a well functioning lane to uh, assist the agencies. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. In your written statement. You said, and I quote, in some ways, ATNF and USGS are positioned to be key enablers in these efforts to achieve a digital government. In what ways do you think the digital service and ATNF can enable the federal government to move into the digital age? Well, they're already serving as disruptors, and as was just discussed, around the cultural change that's necessary. We actually have to change the thought process of the bureaucracies and how they look at technology, and then that translates into how they buy it. Um, and they're leading edge on many of the elements of those different equations that have to be changed before we can fully incorporate technologies. Thank you. Does ITAPS believe that the digital service and ATNF are having an overall positive effect on modernizing the IT questions, the same question? I think in certain areas, yes. I think that um, in some areas, as we discussed, it's hard to tell because of the opaqueness of some of the things you're doing. And then there's still a lot of stuff left on the table that we can all continue to focus on. Thanks. Ms. Crusoe's 18F's mission has always been to promote efficiency and innovation in the way the go federal government approaches IT. Can you provide a few examples of how the agile development is leading to more innovation and cost savings in government? I know you did one, but we want more than one. We want more than one. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, we worked on uh, the veterans, uh, sorry, we worked on the Department of Education's college scorecard, which, uh, which unleashed 25 years of data that had never been seen before by the public. Today it's being used by people going into college to make informed decisions about both what college they go to from an academic perspective, but also how much they spend on college from a budgetary perspective. That was an example, um, that was a very small light build that took over, that took three months, and it showcased agile development, user-centered design, open data, the usage of APIs to the Department of Education, allowing them to get a better idea of what that looks like so that when they go out to vendors and the procurement community, they can actually talk about these things and, and, and weave that into their RFPs. Okay. And what are some of the steps you're taking to advance agile, agile development across the government? We showcase agile methodologies with light prototypes and discovery sprints. Um, when we work with agencies hand in hand, that's when an agency hasn't done it before. So we absorb that first mover risk of taking a leap into a new uh, technology methodology. We also are developing procurement vehicles. One, the first one is the Agile Development BPA, which uh, used code review by our engineers um, to evaluate Agile vendors. These are now pre-qualified, pre-certified vendors that uh, we can access to work on projects and agencies can also access to work on projects. And two questions, what are some of your big, biggest successes and can you identify some of the failed IT projects that ATNF has helped to turn around? Um, one, of the, one of our biggest successes is a, is a turnaround, in my opinion. Uh, we worked with HHS to rewrite an RFP um, for a child welfare platform. Uh, we believe that the platform was going towards a large kind of waterfall uh, singular buy, and we were able to break that down, insert, the, insert modern technology methodologies like Agile, user-centered design, two-week sprints, open data, open code um, into the RFP. We hope that this yields savings for HHS, and we hope that it also yields savings um, for others that can take this, this RFP, and, which is out in the open, and can use it for themselves. Um, for Mr. Dickerson and Ms. Crusos, what, what do your agencies bring to the federal IT innovation that can't already be accomplished by the private sector? I think the most valuable role that the USDS brings into the government uh, is the ability to uh, coordinate and work across all the organizational boundaries to solve what are often very complicated problems with a lot of stakeholders that involve a lot of parts of the agency. Thank you. And I believe that um, we act as, a, as an ecosystem where talented people from the private sector can come in 
and learn how to adapt their practices to government and then show government how to do that. Thank you, and thanks for the extra time. I yield back. Now my honor to recognize the distinguished gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel. Um, uh, Ms. Crusos, uh, as you indicated in your testimony, uh, in two years, uh, uh, 18F has grown from uh, 15 employees to 185, some significant growth. You also indicated part of 18F's mission is to help federal agencies buy, build, and, and deploy technology the way the private sector uh, does today. Um, hopefully with efficiencies that the private sector does in many cases. Uh, can you describe uh, the scope of work anticipated by 18F and how that work overlaps or duplicates capabilities uh, present in the private sector or being performed uh, by the agencies themselves? Thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. Um, I think we need to be, do a better job of explaining our service offerings to um, both our stakeholders and the private sector. We do not intend and we do not, I, in my opinion, we do not compete with the private sector. We offer five service offerings to agencies today and we'll be constantly iterating on those to respond to the needs of our, needs of our customer agencies. The first is to uh, lightly prototype or build, or build small builds to be able to showcase modern methodologies to agencies, which often yields in those agencies going out to the private sector to hire agencies, to hire um, developers that work like us. We offer acquisition assistance where we add an engineer or a subject matter, technical subject matter expert to the table next to the contracting officer to help them rewrite requests for proposals so that agencies can buy smarter. We offer some light um, guides and workshops that help agencies understand how to practice modern technology methodologies in the government. Um, we offer consultation services to CIOs who want to deploy to the cloud. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we offer and I believe that um, our, our, um, our vantage point from bringing in private sector individuals into the government and explaining to them how the government works and then adapting those technologies out is where we, is where we play in this space. Uh, going, going from that, uh, with the rapid growth that you've had, uh, who are you hiring? Uh, are you hiring uh, um, programmers, uh, program managers, acquisition uh, staff? Um, Who are the hires? Uh, technical folks, engineers, design thinkers, usability, usability experts, um, definitely product managers that can help um, product manage uh, teams that are coming in through the Agile BPA. Uh, those are the types of hires that we're hiring. Where do they come from? They come from both private and public sector. So we, we've looked across our organization. I, I actually sign off on every hire. And we've seen people come from Microsoft, come from Twitter, come from Booz Allen, come from Sunlight Foundation. What's their average tenure? Their average tenure, well, we hire uh, using Smarter IT, Author Smarter IT Authority, which is a two-year fellowship with two additional years, a two-year term, sorry, with two additional years. Um, the average tenure in the private sector in this field is around 13 months, if you can, to give you an idea mm -hmm. of what this kind of workforce, how this workforce moves around. So we, we don't have, I don't have the average tenure right now on hand, but I expect that it's around two to four years since that's what our authority is. So, so significantly more than in the private sector. I'm sorry, I don't have exact numbers, but I can work with your staff to get you okay. the number. Um, uh, Mr. LeDuc, uh, are, are there concerns in the software industry about how agency CIOs are being given the information to make informed choices about who to turn to for help with IT concerns? Yeah, I mean, as we understand, and I mentioned this in my testimony, obviously, the, the structure put in place by FATAR and the goal for the CIOs to um, be able to, to monitor and, and determine the, the technologies to be used. Um, the process that, that 18F could take in going through some of their services provided to agencies um, can very well um, go beyond this process and, and not effectively provide CIOs the opportunity to necessarily choose the technologies that they want to use. So we think um, that that could be a, a real challenge area. What's your biggest concerns about how uh, the two agencies, 18F and USDS, have evolved in the past uh, couple of years? 
Um, I think, as I mentioned, the, the biggest concern is, is, is about an evolution and a rapid growth of an entity like, like AT&F um, that's not um, necessarily really visible in how they're behaving. You know, if, if they're making technology decisions very quickly outside the traditional mechanisms, while, while that can be a really good thing, you know, as is the goal of, of, of 18F to be um, modular and flexible, and, and we support that, um, rapid growth in this area um, without significant oversight um, and transparency uh, could really lead to just a, a bunch of single-handed decision-making that could not provide agencies with the best solutions. Okay. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now I'd like to recognize my friend from the Commonwealth of Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pounder, can you help us understand, because I think Mr. Wahlberg's line of questioning um, uh, overlaps my anticipated line of questioning, which is, what is the value proposition here? Why do we have 18F and USGS? What, what is the value to the government, and how does it avoid competing directly with the private sector? Why not just why not just issue an RFP for these services like we normally do? Well, you, you could clearly do that. I think uh, when I look at 18F and you look at where you could go procure really quick agile services and consulting and that, there's some value in that, no doubt. Uh, have, having agencies innovate on a small scale basis and expand it, that makes a lot of sense with 18F. Mr. Dickerson, we've always supported a SWAT team out of the White House that could parachute in. It say, help save healthcare.gov, and we know there are a lot of problems with large acquisitions. There's a top 10 list that goes to the appropriation committees. You guys got an updated report yesterday. We need to fix those large projects. There's a lot of opportunity there. The legacy side of things, not just acquisitions, but swapping out these old legacy where we have a lot of data conversion, application divert, conversion, that's where USDS could really help the federal government. Our concern, these groups, if done right, make a lot of sense. We want to make sure they're transparent, they demonstrate value, and we have cost recovery taken care of with GSA and then with USDS, that it's consistent with what we're trying to do with the CIOs. Under FATAR. Under FATAR, correct. Right. I'll come back to that. Mr. Hodgkins, do you accept that explanation from the private sector point of view that this is sort of a bit of a carve out, it's not a direct threat, not intended that way? And it's to give us some more, you know, fast response time capability within the federal government with some kind of presumably limited scope. I think that uh, to some degree I agree with that answer, although I would uh, share that many of our members continue to, again, because of the opaqueness of the operations, they're not entirely clear that this isn't directly competing with activities that they believe they can deliver. And as I referenced in my testimony, there's a great degree of frustration about the narrative of bringing in new companies because we want innovation. Um, our members are frustrated because they feel that the government unique acquisition process has tamped down their ability to deliver that innovation rapidly in agile ways. Um, they do that for their commercial customers. They have those that are government unique or, or solely in the government space um, have counterparts in the commercial marketplace to do that. And so, to my point in my testimony about unshackling the, the federal government industrial base, um, those companies believe that they can also deliver capabilities to the government market in the ways that these entities are doing it. So do you see it as direct competition, or at least down the road? I think that we have to figure out how to break these molds that are out there that we, you know, for some of them are decades old, and I think this is a great way to start doing that. But I think we also have to spend a lot of time and attention on taking the best practices they create and translating that, because as they've noted, a lot of what they've done has been to help frame, frankly, relatively smaller projects. Um, they, there has not been necessarily the attention to the really big projects, which we believe the kinds of 56-year-old uh, systems this committee exposed are also going to end up being. They're, they're going to take some time and they're going to take some resources. Yep. And we have to figure out how to take the good work that these groups are doing and bringing in those capabilities and then translate that into that scale we yes. need. Yes. Ironically, apparently, we have mastered how to maintain such 56-year-old systems in the federal government. We just don't know how to replace them. Um, so we're going to need help from the private sector, no question. Um, Mr. Dickerson, Mr. Pounder in his testimony said uh, or raised a concern that the lack of clearly defined roles between 
CIOs that we're trying to strengthen and streamline and decision making under our FATARA legislation and digital service teams actually may be inconsistent with the intent of the law under FATARA. Could you respond? I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. Uh, I believe that all of the USDS activity is completely in compliance with both the spirit and the letter of FATARA. Well, you're going to have to do better than that. <laughs> Yes, yes, officer. I believe I was completely in compliance with speeding laws, even though you've stopped me. Uh, GAO thinks otherwise, or has, or has at least suggested it could be a concern. Can, I'm asking you, are you aware of that concern? And besides just defending USDS, what are you doing to ensure that you, in fact, are in compliance with the terms of what is now the law, FATARA? Uh, may I have a minute to respond? Of course. Uh, thank you. With the consent of the chair. <laughs> um, yes. The, you're right. There are important uh, oversight and control mechanisms embedded in FATARA, such as a significant role for the CIO in making uh, decisions that affect IT at the agency. Um, the CIO is always part of the set of agency leadership that we talk to before we embark on or go into uh, a project and decide how to execute it. Uh, we operate completely within the uh, authority to operate or ATO mechanism, uh, and also the CIOs retain the control over the contract decisions, uh, which is specified by FATARA. My time is up, Mr. Chairman, but I hope we get to pursue that just a little bit more. Mr. Pounder, do you have any comments on that last question? Thank yeah, you, Mr. So, Chairman. So I, I do think. Uh, the reason we raised the concern is we talked to four CIOs where there were digital service teams established. DHS, we felt pretty good about that. DOD and VA, fairly good. State Department, the CIO told us initially that they, did, they were not involved with the selection nor the projects being chosen at that agency. We don't think that's appropriate. If they're, that, they ought to be working uh, with each other uh, in that situation. Now, since the State Department kind of backed off of their initial comments, uh, but when you read our report, that's an issue. And the question is, how many of those departments and agencies, we just want to make sure we're in sync. We actually think that if the digital service teams at the agencies uh, coordinate with the CIOs, they're going to be welcomed more into those agencies to work on the big problems and everything. So as an example, at DOD, Terry Halverson, the travel system at Department of Defense has been a mess for years. We haven't been able to deliver on it. So he said, yeah, I want the digital service team to try to tackle that. That's great. They agree on what they're working on, and they agree that that's a priority system that we've had a lot of problems, and that's where Mr. Dickerson can really help move the ball forward with those troubled projects. We just need to tighten it up a little more. Thank you, sir. I'd like to now recognize the distinguished gentleman and scholar from North Carolina, uh, my friend Mr. Walker, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. I'm, I think I'm going to stay right here on this line of questioning and, and kind of if I had, a, had another area I wanted to go to, if I have time, I'll come back to that. But I want to dig it just a little bit deeper. Mr. Pounder, are the charters being established between USDS and federal agencies accounting for the role agencies the CIOs are required to perform pursuant to FATARA? Uh, we think that those charters could be clearer in terms of the relationship with the CIOs. When you say they could be clearer, can you be just a touch more descriptive or specific for me? Yeah, so if you say that we're going to establish a digital service team that reports to the agency head or the depth secretary and that it will also work in conjunction with the CIO and, and those teams will be established consistent with what with FATARA, that's what I'd like to see. Okay, with, with what role will the CIO play in coordinating with the USDS and the OMB to establish the agency dig digital service teams? But I think when you, uh, clearly these CIOs, they should know what the priority acquisitions and the priority legacy conversions are. And working with those CIOs, the most important problems they have, they should be working with these digital service teams so the dig digital service teams can help them solve the most complex things. These guys are pretty smart that have come in, okay? Mr. Dickerson knows how to fix problems, clearly. We want to focus on the big problems that we have in this government because there's a lot of them in the IT world. Sure, absolutely. Who is responsible for making sure these CIOs know? You said they should know. Who's, who's responsible? Whose job is it to make sure that's communicated? 
Well, I think that the CIOs, uh, clearly Tony Scott plays a role in that as the federal CIO. But when you look at the what we're doing with Fatar, if the CIO is to capture all IT spending in a department and then be responsible for the execution of this spending, mm -hmm. that would include what we're doing with the digital service teams. That's under the umbrella. That's what we're trying to fix with Fatar, that there's not a lot of rogue operations going on. And I'm not saying we know that's happening with other services that are being acquired at agencies. Yeah. We want to get our arms around the IT spend, and we want to get the appropriate governance over that so we got the right security and the right delivery. All right, so when a USDS team comes into an agency, who do they report to? CIO, Mr. Dickerson, Tony Scott, someone else? Who is it? I think there are multiple options that could work. I mean, you could actually have them. You want to elevate their position, have them report to the Depth Secretary? Fine. But we got some CIOs that don't report to the Depth Secretary. So I don't think that would be appropriate, as long as they're both reporting at least equally, or we, there's multiple arrangements that could work. We just don't want to have, we don't want to undermine the authorities of the yeah. CIOs. I, I appreciate your frankness on that. Mr. Dickinson, you touched on this a little bit earlier, and I want to get back to, if I have time here, do you think the charters adequately account for the laws established by FATARA? Our charters have evolved over time as we're learning how best to document and set up these teams. Uh, I completely embrace Mr. Pounder's recommendation that we make it more clear and explicit going forward. Uh, our later charters, as noted in the GAO report, uh, are more explicit about that we interact with the CIOs on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Uh, GSA funds 18F through Acquisition Services Fund which operates on the revenue generated from the GSA's business units and not appropriations from Congress. Either Ms. Crusos or Mr. Pounder, can you tell me uh, or give me a list of these business units? Would you like to? Oh. Uh, at GSA, sir? Yes. Um, business units include the business us units under the Federal Acquisition Service, um, like ITS and uh, GSS. It also includes 18F. Okay. okay. Annually, can you tell me how much these units produce for the ASF? I can only tell you the numbers for 18F unfortunately, but I can work with your staff to get you that information. Uh, and, and maybe a couple of weeks, would that be, can you have it as long as there's nothing else happens in your life? Next couple, okay. I'll ask, yes. Okay. All right. I, will, I, will do, I will work with your staff to make sure we get it to you in time. Fair enough. Uh, what are the statutory authorizations to collect such revenue outside of the appropriations process? That's something, we talk about the incredible expansion in the last two years. Something obviously is the American people see more and more bureaucracy expanding. So this, from an accountability standpoint, somebody explained to me, uh, Ms. Crusoe, Mr. Pounder, that it's a statutory authoriz authorization to collect this revenue. Um, well, GSA's mission is to provide the best value in real estate acquisitions and technology. And GSA uses this reimbursable fund to invest in programs that can support that mission and ultimately can support agencies in their mission. So, okay, yeah. I've got 20 seconds, 20 something seconds. Why is it, or let me ask it this way, is, do you think it's intentional? to have this revenue placed outside of congressional jurisdiction, uh, control and oversight? Is, that, is it intentional, or, or why is it? I, I don't believe it's intentional. It's, I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't believe it's intentional. Then, 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 then why do you think it is? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the origins of the fund. I, I'm just familiar with my own finances. I apologize mm -hmm. if, if you have an answer. With that, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The government's messed up, right? Um, the, way, the way we buy IT goods and services is messed up. Uh, we have difficulty getting um, smart people that have the technical skills to solve the problems of the future um, is, is difficult. And what, what, what I think should ultimately be happening is, is everybody that's sitting at this table right now Y'all should be holding hands and, and working together because y'all all ultimately have the, the same goal. Um, because the only way that we are going to get a digital infrastructure within the federal government that is, um, that the American people deserve is if we break some things on the inside, right? And that we utilize the talent of the private sector um, as well. And so, so, but the mentality of, of the startup mentality in the federal government, um, where it comes to disruption is important, but the federal government doesn't um, have the appetite for the level of risk that 
the startup community has or the venture world has, right? And so that's the one thing that doesn't transfer um, between, between, you know, with that, with that narrative. Um, and we have a responsibility to all of our constituents, which is the American people, that we're using their money uh, wisely and, and smartly. Um, I think these programs conceptually are, are great programs. Um, and, and my first question, and maybe we start with you, Mr. Dickerson, how do you decide what projects you work on? It's a very complex process. I will try to make it brief. Um, I spend a tremendous amount of time, uh, and my other members of the leadership team spend a tremendous amount of time gathering information from all over the government, uh, the agency leadership, uh, stakeholders everywhere. Um, time out. Can I, can I make a suggestion? That work is already being done. There's a GAO high-risk report. That high-risk report identifies um, some of the key projects that are a billion dollars or more that are having issues, right? Um, under Fratara, we have, uh, we have uh, established um, a number of areas. Data center consolidation, you know, the, a, a, something as simple as that. We've seen four agencies realize $2 billion in savings. You know, a, a man and a team of your talents would go a long way. Um, the, the CISO of the Social Security Administration needs a whole lot of help, right? And, and this is a, a entity, you know, they should be able to say, hey, when they get grilled here in, at this committee about not following some of the basic practices of good digital system hygiene, they should be able to reach out to you or y'all should be able to call the next day. Is, is that concept, is, is that not, the, is, is, Grade my paper. Does that make sense? Is that you know the flexibility and the way that y'all could be used? As you say, the OMB and the Office of the Federal CIO conduct broad uh, portfolio oversight of all of those programs across the entire government, and we absolutely rely on that information as much as we can. Because there's nobody in the federal government that understands this better than Tony Scott. Right? And, and Tony Scott knows where the problems are and should be able to, 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 to direct you all. But when I look at um, some of the list of you know, um, successes, um, as somebody said earlier, these aren't the tectonic changes that we likely need um, in order to see our governments um, get into uh, the current century, let alone the next century, right? Um, Ms. Crusos, do you have an opinion? about our prioritization process. Mm -hmm. HNF is a demand-driven fee-for-service organization, so our prioritization process um, uses a prioritization rubric that looks at both impact and viability, but we cannot parachute in or we cannot kind of pull in um, customers. They have to come to us and want to work with us. When we look, when things come into our organization, we look at impact, which for us is number of people it impacts as well as potential cost savings. And then we look at viability. For example, is this something uh, better done by the private sector? Is this something that we have the talent for? Is this something we should send to the Federal Acquisition Service or back to the, that agency's CIO? That's how we prioritize. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, would you yield for a second? I, I would. Just by way of follow-up to your point. But Ms. Crusoe says, okay, great, and, and Ms. Dickinson. But the Chairman was asking, but we already have a list of very high priorities from GAO's high-risk list mm -hmm. and some of the priorities we set out in Vitara. Do you also look at those priorities as you're looking at the projects you're going to get involved in? The projects that we get involved in are usually small reference products, like Mr. Hodgkins referred to, that showcase modern methodologies to agencies, and then they go and procure larger teams to actually tackle the big problems. So we don't look necessarily at that GAO high priority list. We don't believe that's our function. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hmm. Um, Let's talk a little bit about IT procurement. Uh, IT procurement is something I spend a lot of time talking about, and, and I've said a uh, number of occasions, IT procurement is not a sexy topic. Um, IT, <laughs> I, I, IT procurement, you're not going to hold a rally uh, for IT procurement or a parade. Um, however, you know, this, this agile delivery service blanket serv purchase agreement concept um, is, is a concept that I think could change this, right? And, and if we fix this, um, Ms. Crusos, I will hold a parade on IT procurement and you will be the Grand Marshal. Um, 
but can you please expand on this agile delivery service and its use of blanket purchase agreements with vendors? Yes, if you had told me as well that IT procurement uh, was something I'd be passionate about two years ago, I would have told you you were crazy. But Ms. Gruses, could you move this closer oh, to you? Sorry, but I believe it's, um, I personally believe it's the single uh, most impactful way to impact what we're trying to do in the government and to move the, go the government forward in technology. Um, the Agile Blanket Purchase Agreement sh shows a lot of promise because for me it, it shows what happens um, in terms of breaking down some of the procurement barriers that Mr. Leduc and Mr. Hodgkin spoke of. When you put an engineer next to a contracting officer and you let them speak and you let them get their minds together, we took engineers from 18F and contracting officers from the Federal Acquisition Services and we put them together and we gave them a problem. Can you get us, can you find us a way to access really innovative, modern, technical talent? And they said, yes, if we look at this and say, instead of asking for pages and pages of documentation and past history, but instead we ask businesses to submit live code in an open GitHub repository, and then we have engineers look at that code and assess it, we'll be able to get to better talent. So how do you, take us through how you choose the vendors, how many vendors are there, and how does 18F work with agencies to choose one of these vendors? So um, we, the blanket purchase agreement is like a pre-selection of vendors. Um, so we work with engineers and contracting officers to go through the documentation the way that you would with any uh, procurement vehicle. That vehicle, um, is you can then put task orders against that vehicle. Right now, agents, we can access the Agile Blanket Purchase Agreement. We actually issued a task order this week to a small business. Um, and agencies can use the Federal Acquisition Service to access this same Blanket Purchase Agreement. Mr. Pounder, does this exist in other parts of the federal government? Is this unique? How do we look? Uh, the VA uh, would, would benefit from this ability. I'm sure Mr. The, the organizations that are part of, of Mr. Hodgkin's and Mr. LeDuc's association would love to be able to participate in these kind of things. Your, your opinion on this? So clearly I think, uh, you know, this is tied to FATARA, to your grades on incremental development. Agile is one way of going really small, right? Uh, these vehicles, if done right, uh, and we're inclusive of the people who should be doing this, I think could really work. I mean, we need, talking about shock the system, we need more agile development. This could actually help a lot. I actually think, and I've said this at times on incremental development, I think Congress and OMB, if you want to fix this Big Bang waterfall approach, don't fund anything unless you deliver within the year. Mm -hmm and have a wave out process, you know what, that would change a lot. You're not going to get funding either through the OMB process or through the appropriation process. We've talked to appropriation committees about this. If you want to really fix it, if you want to go small, fix it, that's the way you would do it. So, this so could help. Ms. Crusos, um, if all of the agencies that had a D or an F on the Agile development within our Fatara scorecard came to you and said, hey, help us figure out how to do this, is that a project that y'all would take on? Um, we've been asked by other agencies to help them build out their own agile blanket purchase agreements. We're not trying to hoard that information. Our documentation is actually out in, in the public um, on GitHub, so you can access, you can build your own agile BPA at your agency if you so desire, or you can come through our organization. And that's something we welcome. I hope all the CIOs that got a D or an F on um, um, uh, their their Fatara scorecard in this area are are getting hitting that website um, as we speak. Um, I have gone over my time. I know Mr. Farenthold has additional questions. Um, the gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on the uh, blanket purchase agreement. Can you tell me? Just in a broad general, what type of services are these? I mean, you've got uh, 17 vendors. What type of services? Um, 17 vendors is for one of the pools. We're authorizing two more pools. And um, software development, DevOps um, are key, uh, design thinkers, those types of thinkers that can work on agile development, user-centered products. All right, so how does this help and not create another barrier? So if I want, if I'm a... I'm a software developer, I want to build a, I don't know, make it simple, an app for the phone to tap into some federal agency. Is getting certified through that, how does that help me and how does that not create another barrier to entry? 
We're trying to create um, smarter bridges between the government and the private sector by putting um, engineering, engineers and contractors together. We just think this is a smarter bridge. We're also at the same time working with the Federal Acquisition Service to try and lower the barriers to entry. We've had a, a really um, interesting project with Schedule 70 where we're looking at creating plain language roadmaps and lowering the time it takes to Schedule 70 significantly. All right, so Mr. Hutchins, is this helping your, your members or is this just another uh, hurdle? Thank you for the question. Um, we're supportive of the agile development approach. One of the challenges that we think um, this particular BPA is that it's only offering or only accepting applications of companies who are willing to code in open source. So all of the companies who have intellectual property in their products are not eligible to compete on this particular BPA, and so they're not offering their solutions in an agile fashion, and that's something we think that you know, we can open that up. Well, I'm a huge advocate for open source. I actually do think that's the way the government can uh, uh, address some security issues as well as uh, make stuff available across government lines. You also talked, though, about uh, unique government needs. And I, I want to, uh, what are the unique government needs that the private sector doesn't have? I mean, you need good user interface, you need good price, you need good security. What are the unique government needs? The government has a lot of unique needs in scale. Uh, it has a lot of unique needs in compliance, that, and it has a lot of unique needs regarding the way the company is expected to operate and shape its business model. All right, so, Ms. Crusoe, you want to talk about what unique government needs are as well? Because I, I think a lot of uh, they're not as unique as people want to want to make them to be, other than size. Yeah. I don't think the government's needs are that unique, and I actually don't think agencies' needs or sub-agencies' needs are necessarily that unique as well. I think if you look across, and we've been trying to see patterns coming in of uh, incoming requests, we see patterns of common technical components that are needed throughout government. It's an area that we should, we should have smart people looking at um, and looking at how to leverage to uh, leverage efficiency. I mean, efficiency that, that's the traditionally government. the GSA's role is to take advantage of the size of government to make things cheaper. I, yes. I, having used the GSA website, I don't know. But um, so is there a, a way to expand something like these blanket purchase uh, agreements to say, all right, this is mm. certified and secure so we don't have every, uh, every CIO in you know, doing the same evaluations of, you know, very similar so or not the same needs in software? I believe so. We're a young organization. We're two years old, and this was our first collaboration with the Federal Acquisition Service. But one of the reasons we created the Technology Transformation Service is to bring some of these ideas and some of these people together at GSA to do exactly what you're talking yeah, about. I think that creates a level of expertise and in, in, in bureaucrat, kind of a CYA, oh, this is GSA certified. I, I don't have to be afraid to uh, buy this and go through a, a, through a lengthy per, uh, purchase process. I did have one other, uh, I think it was your group that was working with the census. We had a hearing yes. uh, on the census. Can you uh, talk a little bit about what uh, your role was and what uh, value you feel we provided to the Census Bureau? That's a, another uh, agency within this committee's direct jurisdiction. I'm so sorry to disappoint you. I actually don't know enough about that to speak to it today, but I'm happy to get you that information. All right, it was just on your list of uh, it, it was a, on your list of things, and I would be uh, interested to uh, to do that. Okay. Uh, and th that's basically all I've got for right now. So I'll yield back. Yes, the gentleman yields back. Mr. Connolly, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, just I want to follow up on just one aspect of um, the the question of uh, the role of the CIO. Um, Mr. Pounder, you gave an example of the State Department CIO not being cognizant or fully aware of what USDS team was doing within the State Department. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Dickerson, does that make sense from a management, good management point of view? I mean, in the private sector, it's almost inconceivable to me that anyone could hire a private IT team and come in and do some work in the corporation without the CIO's knowledge and approval. I mean, that, that would be tantamount to saying you might as well move on because we don't have any confidence in you. Um, how is it possible in the public sector that we're 
a team, your team in this case, would be operating in an agency without the knowledge or express approval of the CIO? So I believe, uh, Mr. Pounder, after making the comment about the State Department, CIO also followed up by saying that uh, they brought those comments back a little bit under discussion. Uh, I looked into this with my team a little bit, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, the CIO at the State Department was a participant in several meetings in the earlier stages of uh, our work at the State Department. Uh, now that being said, there's absolutely a spectrum among the CIOs that we work with uh, of the amount of time and the interest that they have in the digital service type projects, given all their other statutory responsibilities. Well, would you agree, and Ms. Cruzos, please comment as well. Um, generally speaking, it's a pretty good management practice to make sure that your team or your team is operating with the full knowledge and consent of the CIO. I certainly agree that uh, it's an excellent management practice for uh, the CIO and the rest of the agency leadership to all be aware of what we're doing. I agree with Mr. Dickerson. Well, aware of and giving consent. And giving a, a input and consent, yes. Yeah, okay. Ms. Cruces? I agree. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pounder, any last comment on that issue? Because I remember in FITAR what we're trying to do without doing it by fiat, we're trying to evolve to a system where there is a hierarchy and that the CIO is empowered to make decisions and streamline and monitor procurement and pull the plug when it goes bad and you know, look at things in more bite-sized manageable pieces and, uh, and, and make sure the other things, we're talking about legacy systems, data center consolidation, going to the cloud, uh, trying to tap into the domain expertise of the private sector where we don't have it in the public sector, all those things are to be encouraged. What we didn't do is say there shall be one CIO, but that is clearly what we're kind of hoping, that there will be one premier CIO um, and who is aware of what's going on and various moving parts. Mr. Pounder, final word on, on that issue. Well, I think we're heading in the right direction. Look, we, we know from many of your hearings, we have a few CIO organizations that are a bit dysfunctional. They really don't have the right authorities and mm -hmm. cultures that they, they grew up in. And there's some agencies where we really need to tighten that up and fix it. So I think there's a lot of wheels here going at the same time. But the long-term solution is fixing the CIO problem. Yeah. And, and potentially, um, these two programs can be tools for them actually to, to strengthen that, but we, we just don't want to have rogue operations that actually unwittingly detract from the goal, the broader goal we're trying to achieve in FITAR. I thank the Chair. I'd like to recognize Ms. Kelly. Uh, just quickly, uh, Ms. Crusoe's and, and Mr. Dickinson and Ms. Crusoe's, um, what makes your agencies different from each other in funding and the projects you do take on? Um, we are a fee for or what are, are yeah. the differences? We're a fee for service uh, demand driven digital consultancy, and um, as such, we we have a separate it, separate very separate intake and prioritization process. We offer support services. We do view the CIO as our most sophisticated customer. We try and meet their needs by offering support services from the ground up. USDS is not cost recoverable. Uh, we operate off of an appropriation from Congress. Uh, so we go uh, directly to uh, where we're needed as quickly as possible, which means that we are uh, often useful and best applied in cases where there are unanticipated needs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Crusos, um, aren't you required to achieve um, full cost recovery now, and why is it going to take until 2019? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. As the TTS commissioner, this is something I think about and work with my team quite a bit. Um, I work with the h &F management team as well as the CFO, and we look at key performance indicators on a weekly basis to try and iterate the operations of our business to get to full cost recovery. So We're, are you required to have full cost recovery right now? We're committed to... Um, we're required to have a plan for full cost recovery, and we're committed to achieving full cost recovery by 2019. 
If will, not will you plan on sharing publicly 18F's accounting for cost recovery to include cost structures and project charges um, in instances where 18F came in below expected cost or above? I'm happy to work with the CFO's office, and as long as that's allowed by GSA, I'm very happy to, to share that with you. Mr. Pounder, is 18F supposed to rec achieve full cost recovery now? Uh, I believe that there's a, a plan, to, there's a requirement for a plan to get there. Obviously, they want to do it as soon as possible. I do think that when you have a startup, there is some, you know, you need to build up to it because the, 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 pay, the payout is actually lagging what they're doing. Is GAO um, receiving the information that you need in order to determine that they're, gonna, they're on a path to a full cost recovery? Yes, we have received that. I think by 2019, that's the plan. I mean, they got a worst case, best case, most likely case. There's some good numbers there, uh, and that is the most likely case to recover by 2019. I think our report says the worst case is around uh, 2020, 2022. Good copy. Um, Mr. Dickerson, um, USDS is directed to provide quarterly reports to the committees on appropriations in both the House and Senate describing current USDS teams and projects that include the top 10 priority programs. Has that been provided to the appropriations committees? Our most recent top 10 project report was transmitted yesterday, I believe. Now, is that um, the same document that we, re we received um, titled um, Report to Congress 10 High Priority Programs? That's right. Um, is that for OMB or is this directly for USDS? The reporting direction from Congress changed between the last two years' appropriations. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is kind of the last production under the joint OMB-USDS uh, oversight. So you see some projects that USDS is involved in and some that we are not. Uh, the new direction from Congress with the most recent appropriation is that USDS uh, report on these projects going forward, and that is our plan. Good copy. Uh, do you know what the joint legacy viewer is? I'm uh, in passing familiarity, yes. Is that true interoperability? I think it's an excellent first step. It's certainly a better place to be that you're able to see records from two, two different systems together in the same place. Uh, my understanding is that that's found very valuable by the clinicians that are trying to serve those veterans. Uh, there's certainly farther to go. Uh, more interoperability would still be better. And what does USDS's role in the interoperability between VA and DOD? And I know you mentioned something earlier, but I'd love to hear a, a little more robust answer. We've, uh, it's a very big problem, uh, and we have uh, bitten off some pieces of it that we think we can have a really strong impact on. One of those is the um, transmission of the service treatment record between the DOD and the VA uh, at the end of a veteran's active duty service. Copy. My last question is to everybody, and please answer in like 20 seconds. What is your key takeaway from today? Mr. Pounder, let's start with you. You're the most experienced uh, witness at the table. Let's continue to fix the CIO problem. Mr. Dickerson. Uh, I'm, I'm very gratified to hear uh, unanimity on the point that 18F and USDS have an important role to play in uh, improving our, our overall government services. Uh, I certainly take away the point that there are many parts to this problem, and all of us have an important uh, role to contribute to it. Uh, and I'm happy to embrace the recommendations from GAO. Ms. Crucis. Um, the key single takeaway is that we cannot do this alone. It's a very ambitious and important goal that we all share between us and that more information sharing is better. Mr. Hodgkins. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for letting us be here. Um, the takeaway for us is, is that uh, we support these programs. Uh, it's good to hear that they are on a good trajectory. We want to keep them that way so that these activities can be sustained in the next administration. Uh, but this is a big problem, and they're a part of a solution, but they're not the whole solution. Mr. LeDuc, you get the last word. Well, we're delighted that, that these subcommittees are, are committed to their, their oversight role. So we're, we're very happy about this hearing today. Um, we're delighted that. Um, GAO has, has done a very thorough review in, in their work, and we believe that the, combined these two things together can really help to uh, focus 18F and USDS. 
We'd like to thank our witnesses, especially Mr. Dickerson and Ms. Crusos, so y'all is testifying for the first time before Congress. I appreciate all y'all taking time to appear before us today. If there's no further business, without objection, the subcommittees stand adjourned. <laughs>